The grace of God. What is the grace of God? A theology tutor said, grace is God's personal attitude towards us because he sees us as unique individuals. Matthew chapter 10 reports Jesus as saying that so close is God's relationship to us that the hairs on our heads are numbered. <laughs> In my case, <laughs> God wouldn't take oh, <laughs> very long whatsoever, would he, <laughs> to count them. So crucial to himself is our relationship to him, and so great is his love for us that he wants us to be with him forever, eternally. That is the reason why he took the initiative and came to live amongst us. And he died, died on the cross. The question then arises as to what prompted such dramatic action. Accounts vary across ancient cultures. The Judeo-Christian one has the Adam and Eve account, the paradise, paradise lost. But there is a common theme amongst all religions. Whichever way it is put, the commonality is that the ancients were convinced that humankind was not then in the same state as it was when it was created. They, and the generations which followed, sensed a gulf between what we are and what we were created to be. So wide is that gulf, it's vast. We cannot bridge it. Matthew 11 and Luke 16 both report human impotence on this point. Nothing we can do. Furthermore, as well as being recorded by all the ancient religions, the gulf also lies behind theories raised by modern humanist psychologists and Marxist philosophers. They too recognise the disparity between what we are and what we feel we ought to be. But they address it not in religious terms or biblical terms, but by using terms such as an existential dichotomy, which leads to cognitive dissonance. Now that's a clever term, but it means exist existential means we just have to live with it because it's in the nature of existence. During my talk on the Holy Spirit, I drew a distinction between being as comprising a mortal body and an immortal soul and said that the Holy Spirit was not a part of our being as such. However, God does allow us to share his own power through the Holy Spirit. And so it is by his grace, his intention, that the gulf between us is bridged. Paul writes to the Ephesians and he writes, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. So we're saved by faith which is itself a gift of God. In other words, the gulf can be bridged and it is his grace through Jesus and the Holy Spirit that makes that bridge possible. That spirit can come into the lives of ordinary men and women today, not just then, today, and allow us to speak in God's name and to heal the sick and to fully express God's grace to us. It comes through individuals and gives good men and good women direction 
and the power to proceed. It is that same spirit that helps us to speak honestly, plainly to other people of our redemption. To those who are lost, people who are lost can hear what's happened to us. And those in dire need of love and care. So powerful is God's desire for humanity that at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was, I think the term was, poured out upon all flesh. It came into the lives of hundreds of people to the extent that they couldn't help themselves but reciprocate by sharing the news of God's grace with others. That Pentecostal moment actually has never gone away. It might appear to have been hidden, from, but it has never gone away. It lives and works in the lives of many people, particularly, but not exclusively, those of the, I would call it the, the Baptist tradition, the less formal groupings, those imbued with the Spirit, as at Pentecost, are able to speak in God's name, heal the sick, and to fully express God's grace to others. However, since about the third century after Christ had died, it has not been mainstream, and since then it has, has rarely won the hearts of powerful people. And it goes back to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is personal and cannot be bureaucratized, large organizations are inflexible to the unpredictable effects of the encounter with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't fit the standardized conformity, the bureaucratization processes, because it's individual. It will, however, move in individual lives through those who have taken personal, personal ownership of their own failings, admitted, and given ownership of solutions to the grace of God. You see this quite often in confession, Lord, I have sinned, and that's true, isn't it? The grace was beautifully expressed, however, the grace of God, by John Newton. 1725 to 1807 in his poem Amazing Grace. Newton's early life was not religious. At 15 he was pressed into the Royal Navy and on release he stayed at sea on slave ships. In 1748, aged 23, a violent storm severely battered his ship, wooden ships, he called out to God for mercy. He survived and was converted and eventually became an abolitionist and an Anglican curate. He also met and collaborated with William Cooper and in preparation for his 1773 New Year Day sermon, Newton wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come, tis grace hath brought me safe this far and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. In my Holy Spirit video, I said that we open ourselves to the Spirit when we are baptised and able to distinguish goodness. In so doing, we symbolically 
arise out of the waters, cleansed of all our past, and enter a new life. We are reborn. I have not, however, seen evidence that John Newton was himself ever baptised, but his words convince us that the grace of God is sufficient to sustain his own work on earth. In verse 1, Newton sees himself, frankly, as a wretch, which reminds me of the Pharisee we spoke about earlier, who proudly, proudly told God how he kept all the laws. The tax collector, on the other hand, in the temple square, contritely compared himself against what God had intended him to be. One, the Pharisee, saw himself as righteous. The other believed himself as unrighteous, or in Newton's case, wretched. Jesus knew that by measuring oneself against what God made us to be, was to acknowledge God's grace. That's what we measure ourselves against. Whereas measuring oneself against the law was to assume a precedence of law over grace, which should take precedence. Jesus was clear. The law was made for man, not man for the law. The tax collector saw the truth when comparing himself for what he was against what God had intended him to be. And we can all do that, can we? That truth made him free and can make us free when we put grace above the law. Too many folks seem not to understand that embedded in the Bible's wisdom are solutions to lots of the worries of modern people. One of these days, you know, I, I, I really have been saying it for years, I would like to talk about how the words of Jesus address problems now labelled as mental or psychological, many of which, many of which I believe, can be resolved by accepting faith in faith, that God's intentions towards us are those of a loving Father. His grace can make us free and make us whole. Some of us may feel a sort of distance from our own fa earthly fathers, I certainly did when he was alive, due to our trying to possibly meet his expectations or, or what we thought were his expectations, or match his achievements. And sometimes, as in my case, it is now too late to redeem the past. It's gone. The chance is gone. Just imagine then, if there's a gulf between son and father, how great is the gulf between us and God, the creator of all things. I read that Einstein, that the physicist uh, used now in the ads for power meters or something, he believed in a creator but could not see how God could possibly have any interest in him. On the contrary, his contemporary Carl Gustav Jung, one of the early founders of psychology, said, I do not believe in God. I know he exists. For Einstein, the gulf was unbridgeable. For Jung, it had been bridged. Throughout the ages, Christians have given um, testimony through, through deeds, through words, through charitable acts, and through artistic endeavours, all whilst acknowledging that love is at the root of God's gracious manner towards us. The tutu was right. 
God's attitude towards us is gracious. His grace led John Newton to change from slave trader, or at least he was on the ships, to abolitionist, and to see the first stage of its abolition in 1807. Although he died before it was completed in 1833, at that point, Britain was trying to then persuade uh, the world to abolish slavery. And many British sailors' lives were lost in the process of uh, doing just that, freeing them. His final verses were, Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. This earth shall soon dissolve away, the sun from bare to shine, but God, who called me here below, will be forever mine. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Thank you for listening and watching. And God willing, my next talk will be on salvation. Amen.